Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. This week, we met people solving issues in their communities all over the country, including helping teachers in Tennessee, supporting single moms in Baltimore, and saving endangered dolphins in the Pacific. But we begin our journey in the Big Apple, where the wealth inequality is worsening. But a new guaranteed income program is aiming to help alleviate family poverty in the city. Jerika Duncan has more. Chomp, chomp. When 35-year-old Marine Gardner was pregnant with her now five-month-old son, Garrett, she was on the brink of being homeless. It's really hard to think about. I don't know. I don't know. I would have to maybe be in a shelter, you know, and find other ways to get assistance for myself and my baby. For years, she worked as a director of a nonprofit after-school program. But right before the pandemic hit, she left. She went through her savings and soon found herself expecting a child with no job. I'm pregnant. It's a pandemic. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. A social worker told her about a new program where she could get $500 to $1,000 a month for three years. The pilot program known as The Bridge Project aims to keep mothers and their babies out of poverty. Holly Fogel is one of the founders. Cash is a universal answer to individual problems. We cut out all the bureaucracy. We go right to the mother who knows more than anyone else in the whole world what that baby needs today. How crucial has this been for them? I think it is summed up by mothers will say, I'm able to breathe. Peekaboo. The Bridge Project is open to pregnant women and new moms in certain low-income neighborhoods in New York City. By this summer, the program will have more than 600 mothers enrolled. We chose three years very intentionally. Um, first, because those first thousand days of life are so, so critical for the baby's brain. We know that the baby's brain is doubling in size by the time they're three years old. It's at 80% of its adult capacity. So we're really laying the foundation for the rest of their life. Fogel says right now the average income for mothers participating is less than $15,000 a year. Where does the funding come from? The funding comes from the Monarch Foundation, which is fully funded by my husband and myself. How much money does this program, is it costing right now? Between our first and second phase, we will spend about $16 million. And all of that money is from you and your husband? It is. The Bridge Project will monitor its participants and hopes to be a model for similar programs nationwide. Some people might hear $1,000, free money, you don't have to do anything. How do you ensure it's going to the right person, a mother who's gonna use that money the right way? Fundamentally, our program is based on trust and the dignity of human beings. And at the end of the day, as a mother, I know she's gonna make the right decisions for her babies, and I, I trust that. And so my money's on her every day. Now we turn to the great resignation, the national economic trend where more than 20 million people quit their jobs in the second half of 2021. And schools have certainly not been spared. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that 5.4 percent of educational services jobs were open in December 2021, more than double from a year prior. Meg Oliver takes us to Tennessee to see how a residency program could be a win for future teachers and classrooms. All right, here we go. An hour north of Nashville, Tennessee, at Kenwood Middle School. The primary wave and the secondary wave. Demetrius Wynn tries to explain seismic waves to this eighth grade class. All right, so we know it's 830 because this is our 830 block. Two years ago, the 42-year-old father of four spent his days mopping floors as a school custodian. It's definitely been a change. Do you feel it's a calling? Oh, definitely. Definitely it's a calling uh, because, like I said, it was... It was something I wanted to do, just didn't know how it was going to happen. It all started in 2018. Facing a lack of diversity and a growing teacher shortage, Clarksville Montgomery School District launched an innovative teacher residency program, recently registered as the first of its kind in the country. Sean Impertris is their chief academic officer. If you didn't have this program in place right now, how bad would the teacher shortage be? We would have had about 150 teachers short. The program squeezes a four-year degree into three. If they commit to teaching in the district, night school is free. They co-teach during the day with a mentor and earn up to $27,000 a year. When they graduate, their salary almost doubles. How will that change your life? 
Oh, it will open up a lot of opportunities for me. Uh, like I said, um, I have grandkids, and so that gives me an opportunity to be there, uh, not only uh, financially, but also um, physically. So here we go. The program is funded through the school district's regular budget and with the help of state and federal grants. In 2021, Tennessee committed $6.5 million over two years to support the program, now operating in 63 Tennessee school districts. You have 80 teachers that are going to graduate this year. How long will it take you to actually catch up to fill all your positions? Sometimes with the shortage, it compounds, right? So if it stays the same as this year, we'll be okay next year. Is this a model that the rest of the country could follow to solve the teacher shortage? Now that it's registered, absolutely. Would you give Mr. Wynn an A? You feel good, right? They feel generous. <laughs> so what you're looking at is your 30 seconds. Wynn will graduate with a bachelor's in education and a minor in special education in 2023. How does the future look? The future is bright. The future is bright. Like uh, the end game, I, I know that once I become a, a full-time teacher, that like the opportunities are endless. Endless opportunities helping fulfill educational dreams. After the break, finding harmony in community. We'll introduce you to a unique orchestra whose forte is inclusion. You're watching Eye on America. A symphony of sounds. Music is known to have a positive effect on our mental health and well-being. Nancy Chin goes behind the curtain to hear how one orchestra is fighting the stigma of mental illness in the music community one note at a time. There have been plenty of high and low notes for those on stage here at Boston's storied Symphony Hall. But when these musicians perform together, there is simply harmony. What does music bring to your life? Music brings to my life everything. Ronald Brownstein was once a music director at Juilliard and conducted around the world. I was able to learn and memorize complete symphonies overnight. But then the award-winning conductor was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which he says cost him work. It was a constant up and down. I just want an orchestra of people like me. Along with his wife, Brownstein started the Me Too Orchestra for people with mental illness and those who support them. Musicians like Josh Santana. What have you found with the orchestra? Playing music is so powerful when you are all joined by a common mission. The New England-based orchestra has inspired ensembles around the country, all with the same focus, ending the stigma. We aren't trying to be the greatest orchestra in the world. We are just trying to create a community. A community orchestrating inclusion and appreciation. Each day, about 28 people in America die in drunk driving car crashes. Four years from now, all new cars will be required to have anti-drunk driving technology as part of President Biden's infrastructure bill. In a story we first reported last May, Errol Barnett traveled to Virginia to see the first of this life-saving technology and spoke with the mother of a drunk driving victim. We want to note the woman we spoke with for this story, Patricia Kimmel, has since passed away. He never took another breath. Patricia Kimmel recalling the moment her son Stephen died. We watched all of his veins turn blue because of lack of oxygen in his body and my hands were on his chest. You know, just because I wanted to feel his heart until it stopped altogether. T-boned in 2018 by a drunk driver, Stephen Kimmel's car flipped three times before ejecting him. It was the other driver's third drunk driving arrest. Kimmel says it's unacceptable that this continues to happen. It's beyond belief because, again, it's 100% preventable. No alcohol detected. A promising new technology, more than a decade and $100 no million dollars in the making, is aimed at preventing such accidents. I hope this is the next seatbelt. Fits in your hand. Right now it fits in my hand because the available space in a modern car is about the size of a baseball. The sensors here, as you can see as we're talking, they are picking up our breath. 
Robert Strasberger so we, leads a group of over a dozen top car makers joining forces with Mothers Against Drunk Driving to back the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety, or DADS. Verify me. Warning, alcohol detected. Here's how it works. The sensor can detect the blood alcohol content on your breath all in the matter of seconds. If it's above the legal limit, 0 0.08, the ignition won't turn. Joe Belvedere, helping to test the system, just had two shots of alcohol. Car not started. The keys electronically taken away. But when I took the driver's seat sober... Please provide breath sample to sensor. No alcohol detected. The screen turns green and I'm on my way. Since each of us processes alcohol differently, the makers are calibrating this technology to account for differing driver weights, weather conditions, mask wearing, and even attempts to trick the system. For example, you're sitting much farther away from the sensor. If you leaned over, you would rule that reading out. And for transportation businesses, the manufacturer says this ensures the driver is 100% safe. We really look at technology to help safety. And, and I think that's a huge benefit for the traveling public. James River Transportation in Richmond has been on the road testing this technology for two years. This technology actually provides us that extra benefit of knowing our driver's going to be safe with no alcohol in their system. A peace of mind Patricia Kimmel sums up with a simple question. Why not require the technology to stop anyone from driving drunk? According to the Pew Research Center, almost a quarter of children under 18 in the United States live in single-parent households, the highest rate in the world. And for families led by single moms, it could mean higher risk of poverty and added stressors that have a ripple effect on their children. But as Gene Song shows us, one program in Maryland is helping address the well-being of these families with a holistic approach in mind. Pay attention to how your breath feels. Envision something for yourself and for your mother-daughter relationship. An exercise in visualizing the future is only the beginning of the Growth at Bond, a Baltimore nonprofit that serves single mothers of color and their daughters. Atira Griffin is a founder and CEO. My grandmother raised three children all by herself, and my mother also raised my brother and I by herself with the support of my grandmother. And it was tough. You know, I saw the challenges that she faced. But it wasn't until Griffin became the dean of students at a Baltimore charter school for young women that she started to notice a pattern. One of the greatest joys I had was talking to my girls. They would tell me everything they were going through all of the ups and downs, the challenges. And I would have to ask them, you know, have you talked to your mother or your maternal figure about this? And the answers I got, they would say, no, um, we don't have that kind of relationship. No, I don't want to put anything else on her plate. I don't want to be a burden. And then on the flip side, when I started to have moms come in my office and ask me, can you help me with my relationship with my daughter? Or can you help me fill out this job application? Can you help me get through the line at the housing department or at social services? And so these things weighed on me. Unable to find an existing program that would help address these multi-generational requests, Griffin launched Bond in 2015 with the help of her own mother and lead counselor, Elisa Williams. It's a lot of fun. It's interesting. I get to grow with her. And then there's challenges because I have my own personality and she has her own personality. <laughs> in addition to mentorship programs that focus on social emotional needs, Bond also offers a financial wellness curriculum built by and for black women. Griffin says more than two-thirds of bond moms have been able to increase their salaries by one tax bracket. And then we're going to buy a house, and I want to pay off all of our debt. At meetings, moms like Taisha Johnson and her daughter Akira find a safe space to be intentional and share goals. I think we've always had a pretty close relationship because it is just her and I. But as I was going through grad school, I did have to pick up a part-time job. So it was a way that we would have this dedicated time doing specific activities. The activities we do together help us get to know each other more or just learn new things that we didn't know before. I'm proud of her because she works hard and she tries her best to do everything that she can. 
Addressing these needs in a multi-generational way provides us the opportunity to have exponential impact. One of the biggest things that I see is just this new, open, very clear communication between moms and daughters that also includes language around our emotions and our mental health. We don't have the privilege of just talking about our emotions all the time in the black community and as black women. Among Bond's aims is also shifting the narrative surrounding single mothers. There are so many stereotypes and I've seen it broken time and time and time again mm -hmm. from my mom to my grandmother to some of my friends. Mm -hmm. like, they are phenomenal. They are strong. They are some of the most persistent, loving, mm -hmm. and giving people I know in my life. And I have so much respect for them. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Yeah, some of them are groundbreakers. They're you know. just going places. But they say it needs to expand beyond the fortitude of these families. Changing the conversation means having people with lived experience mm -hmm. in, in positions of power, mm -hmm in leadership, their voices, it's what can guide changes to policies mm -hmm. like paid leave. Mm -hmm. We're talking about housing policies that need to change. Raising the living wage across the nation, we need to work on these very specific policies that directly impact single mothers of color and that is how we also change the narrative. And with that, Bond hopes to continue the mission of what their name stands for, building our nation's daughters. Look out, killer whales are in the water. See how one man is saving the ocean's top predator. This is Eye on America. Our final stop, the Pacific Northwest. It's home to the largest dolphins, also known as orcas. They are critically endangered, threatened by hunting, captivity, pollution, and scarcity of food. I recently met with a dedicated researcher whose life's mission is to ensure the preservation of this marine wildlife community. Off the coast of Port Angeles in Washington state, there's a team that has whale watching down to a science. For the past 45 years, Ken Balcom has taken to the waters of the Pacific Northwest, leading the ORCA survey a long-term photo identification project focusing on what's known as the southern resident killer whale population of Puget Sound. Well, this is where we had our very first encounter on the 8th of April, 1976. I saw a dorsal fin and uh, they were heading west, so we turned around and went with them. At 35 years old, camera in hand, Balcom was working for the National Marine Fishery Service and tasked with counting how many whales were left after the practice of capturing killer whales from marine parks ramped up in the 1960s and 70s. A lot of people didn't think we could find them. And then even my boss didn't think if we found them, we could tell them apart. An impossible job made possible using photo ID techniques pioneered by a Canadian marine biologist. It turned Balcom's hundreds of thousands of photos into a scientific database. At that time, we had photographs, 35 millimeter pictures. That was a real key. The results of the survey? Only about 70 orcas remained in the sound, with an astounding 40% of the population having been taken into captivity or killed during a capture attempt. Balcom's findings would help end the trade in killer whales in the Pacific Northwest. But the orca's man-made problems didn't stop there. In the late 1980s, the whales stopped doing their regular pattern and uh, basically they weren't coming to Puget Sound twice a month anymore. It was fished out. A depleted food supply, an issue that continues for the whales today which greatly inhibits their ability to reproduce. This is our indicator, advanced indicator, the canary in the coal mine kind of thing. If we lose the ball on uh, the wild nature, uh, humans are not going to last very long after that. In response to what he's already witnessed, Balcom founded the nonprofit Center for Whale Research to study the whales and use their findings to promote conservation. As we cruised along the Salish Sea, Balcom told me that orca sightings were a weekly occurrence in these waters decades ago. 
The Orcas have called this place home for many thousands of years, their presence first documented by the Native Americans. But on our voyage, we saw not a single one, a sad situation that Balcom is working to change. Not at sea, but about eight miles upstream on the edge of Olympic National Park. Balcom took us off-roading for a look at both the source of the problem and a possible solution. This is the Elwha, Elwha River. And it's essential to your operation. Uh, it's essential for the whale's food. Right. It's going to bring salmon back to a pristine status where there'll be lots of food for the whales. What happened to the salmon? Well, on this river, it was dams. We had a dam about two miles south of us, and no fish passed that dam for 100 years. The population of the Chinook salmon went from around 30,000 a year to almost zero. In an effort to restore the river's ecosystem, Congress authorized the removal of the Elwha Dam in 1992. After decades of planning, the largest dam removal in U.S. history began and was fully removed by March 2012. This river had the biggest salmon that were in the Pacific Northwest. They were up to 125 pounds. Really? Huge fish. And they fed a food chain, and the whales were part of it. So uh, now that the dams have been removed, this is starting to come back and we want to celebrate it and you know, let the world know that that's how you do it, Reco recover the ecosystem. And Balcom went a step further. In October of 2020, at the age of 80 and without a job, his Center for Whale Research purchased this 45-acre ranch bordering both sides of the waterway, where the majority of the remaining Chinook salmon spawn. The $700,000 price tag looming over his head and his heart, until a private donor stepped in. When they called up and said, uh, we want to pay it off, I was like, I started shaking. It was an honor. It still is. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> In your legacy, everyone's legacy. It's the whales. It's the whales. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for them. Oh, yeah, there they go. A healing process that Balcom can now check in on and record whenever he wants. He took us to the section of the river where the salmon spawn, doubting that we would find any action. It was to our surprise... Oh my gosh, they're way over there. They're over there. Do you see them? <laughs> yeah. Way over there. Something's yeah. going down. If it can be done, Balcom says, it will take 20 to 25 years to get the salmon back to their original numbers. But for now, the few fish we spotted together are a sign of hope. We're really lucky. I mean, to be able to just walk up and, oh, there they are. That's like walking up and seeing the whales go by. So. Yeah, it's not quite as exciting, but it's pretty exciting. <laughs> Last year, around 7,000 Chinook salmon were counted in this river. This is the fruit of your labor. This is it. This is what I wanted to see. Last year, I just saw two. This year, what, you had eight over there, or two or three here. They're still coming by. So describe what that feeling is. Uh, oh, this is like, they're back. Where nature's coming back, it's, it's just like, it's worth it. Money doesn't count, this counts. You know, this is whatever it takes. And it is, for whatever it takes, Ken Balcom is ready to do it. Well, for more features like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.